As the eyes of the world focus on the latest flood of calamities, the most urgent may not be the most visible to the average person. Yet it is a growing menace that could ravage Western civilization. For decades, we have seen an erosion of Christian values, but today we are experiencing a world gone mad. The lessening influence of Christianity, the resistance to the guardrails of biblical morality, are all producing growing decadence and cultural disintegration. Christ followers are being edged out of cultural and political influence. Attacks coming from seemingly all sides, from within the church and from the outside. Cultural norms are shifting. The erosion of civilization is accelerating. What can we do in a world hostile to Christianity? Join us now for a special Leading the Way presentation, This Present Crisis with Dr. Michael Yusuf. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Leading the Way with Dr. Michael Youssef. You know, 2020 presented some very unique challenges to say the least, and no one in the entire world escaped those challenges. This present crisis is still with us. It's more than a global pandemic though, it's personal. It's sort of a rapid erosion of the values that define us, the values that form the boundaries that hold our society together. And at the very heart of it is the decline of the influence of the Christian church. Dr. Michael Youssef, pastor, author, and also sociologist, how do you put your finger on just how to define this time of crisis in the world? Right. The crisis is the crisis of truth. And, and when you have a crisis of truth, you're gonna end up in falsehood. And that's no wonder the, the Satan, who is the father of lies, appears as an angel of light. And so the truth is what matters. The pandemic is like uh, putting the tea bag in the hot water. <laughs> it just made it obvious, made it, brought it to the forefront. But it's been building up. It's been building up ever since the 60s where the motto was trust your feelings. Mm. And slowly but surely we have departed from thinking, from uh, rigorous thought to well, how you feel. Uh, we, don't people, we don't ask people anymore, what do you think? We say, how do you feel about it? And feeling is not a very reliable measurement. But that's the problem. We have ceased to think and therefore we are all feeling people. And with that, we have abandoned the very moral foundation upon which Western civilization is built. And we have seen with our own eyes, the pand I'm really thankful for the pandemic. I know some people are gonna think I'm crazy and they're gonna say, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> but please trust me, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with me. Because what, it, what is below, it came up to the surface. But at the same time, also from a spiritual perspective, I have a very strong views and they're my personal, only my views. And that is, I think our Lord is beginning the separation process between the sheep and the goats mm -hmm. and the true believers and, and that. So we started in the 60s, trust your feelings. We have come full circle now where our feelings literally gonna drown us if we're not careful. And if we do not do what the Bible said, the only thing we're supposed to do. How did it happen though? How did facts, take a second seat to feelings. You said it's been happening for a while. Right. Is there some movement behind it or? Well, you have to understand this is human nature from the very beginning. God performs 10 miracles in the eyes of the Israelites in Egypt. I mean, 10 miracles. They've seen with their eyes some incredible supernatural intervention of God. They go to the wilderness. Moses goes away for a few days, and what do they do? Here, here's our gold. Let's have a bull. See, that's feeling. We're feeling, not what we saw with our own eyes, the evidence. People say, oh, if we have miracles today, people would believe. I want to tell you, if we have miracles today, people will not believe. Wow. They did not believe in the time of Jesus, and they will not believe now. That's really has been from the very beginning, from the early days of the Bible. They always fall back on the flesh, what's easy on the flesh, what's easy on the fallen nature. 
that's who we are by nature. And that is why we need that awakening, that, that, that opening of the spiritual eyes and realize that sin is sinful, sin is powerful. Sin is gonna take people to eternity in hell unless we repent. And that is the biggest alarm bell that I can ring in my lifetime. You talked about Western civilization really being at stake. Yeah. You say that in a way that we're not talking about 200 years from now, we're talking about now. No. Look at, walk us through, Michael. Yeah. What has Christianity contributed to Western civilization? Oh not goodness. even from a religious perspective, yeah, sure. just the way we relate to each well, other. Not only democracy, which at, at the base of its civility, that I can disagree with you, but I still love you. That's Christianity. Mm -hmm. You cannot find that in any other religion. You cannot find that in any other system. Uh, the very fact that uh, we have uh, technology, uh, it came because we respect the human life, the, we value human life. And so we want to make life easier and more thoughtful of the other person. The whole technology came from it. But let's go back to the very, very basic thing. Sin is recognized by Western civilization and which began by the Reformation uh, as something that is abhorrent to God and therefore we fear God and we, even the, the ones who don't believe, they still kind of know what's right and what's wrong because of the culture. Now that's gone. There's no room for Jesus. There's no room for Christianity. So is that where it starts? It starts by tearing down Christianity? Absolutely. Or the other way around? Ab well, yes, because when you take away the light, what are you going to get? It's mm. darkness. Uh, no matter who it is, it's be darkness. And this so-called post-truth culture, it's actually now... A, Define a, that. It's, it's in People the dictionary. People hear you say that. What does that mean, post-truth culture? It's in the dictionary now. I mean, they are really... Uh, uh, Oxford has post-truth culture. Wow. That is, no longer there is absolute truth that is non-negotiable. That your truth and my truth and history, this is post-truth culture that we all have our own truth. And when we do, we're gonna be killing each other. Well, how do I know what your truth is and how can it coexist with my truth? It won't be able to coexist. They may say it, it can and it should, but it won't. That's just a fact. Because they, they really fail to take into account the fallenness of the human mm -hmm. nature. Only those who understand the original sin and the sin that rebelled against the Creator God, will understand where we are. If you undermine original sin, and say, we are so good, people are good. I mean, that's basically what the Humanist Manifesto said, man is good. Uh, the Swedish Humanist Manifesto said, man is very good. Uh, so we, we, uh, we, we, when you start there, then you have no basis for which you can deal with each other. And chaos will, will reign and the strongest is going to be dominant over the week. If I say something, maybe unintentionally yeah. offending you, yeah. then at some point my job, my livelihood may Absolutely. even be at stake. I mean, we're really seeing these quiet but yeah. really incendiary. I mean, these are things that have been happening and going on below the surface and now they're coming out above the surface. Maybe a good thing that people can see it, but also could be a bad thing. Uh, people said, well, ho-hum, you know, it's just, it's not gonna affect me or my family, I'm fine. Well, but many Christians too are going along with that in that, well, I don't wanna offend anybody yeah. by offering to pray with them. I don't wanna be offensive. Where's that line where we continue to love and serve Christ sure. and yet respect? I am totally respectful of person that if, I'm, if, I, uh, I, if I have a neighbor who's not a believer, and I would say to him, and he tells me he's sick and, and sharing, well, obviously they know why they tell me. <laughs> and I said, would you like me to pray for you? And they can say no, and that's fine too. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to pray with you? If they say no, that's fine, I'll respect that. But if, I, if he says yes, and I'll pray with him, and then I get uh, sued in the, in the court of law because uh, somebody else didn't like it, that's what's happening. Right. How do we stop that? Is it, per, is it a broader Christians are being persecuted? Oh, no question about it. 
and it's going to heat up and it's going to get worse unless God's people truly get serious and get on their knees and really believe that God can do great and mighty things. We saw an image not long ago, months ago, of a man on top of a church in England, literally trying to rip the cross off the church. I think a lot of people yeah, saw, I saw that, that. I saw it. And yep. just kind of went, oh yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But it seems like that's almost a, a visual yeah. of what's really happening. It's worldwide. exactly it's exactly what happened. This Muslim young man went up and uh, and and took the cross off a church, and the pastor, well, you know, we just need to love him, and we don't need to put the cross in case it offends him. And see, we start with, so we don't want to offend anybody. Right. So we remove the crosses from our church buildings. Today, most modern churches have no crosses anywhere because they don't want to offend anybody. Mm. They want to be seeker friendly. Well, the Bible said no one seeks after God, but God is the one who seeks after us. And you want to be a seeker friendly, you better invite Jesus to take over your church. <laughs> invite Jesus to take over your life. And otherwise, when these crosses are gone, because the cross is a symbol, and the cross says that I'm a sinner, I'm heading for hell, and I need a savior. And that Savior came from heaven, died on that cross, and rose again. But I want to save myself. I'm the captain of my ship. I am going to be in charge of my life. I mean, look at the abortion. Mm. It's not murder. It's personal choice. It's, con it's control of my body. And once you change these definitions, uh, all of a sudden, life has been devalued, and we're back in the dark ages. What can we do to get back to truth? It's not lost. I know you. I know the way yeah. you think. No. This is the problem. What is the solution? Well, if I believe us all is lost, I wouldn't be sitting here exactly. today. I wouldn't be standing in that pulpit Sunday after Sunday, uh, pouring my heart out. But because I believe in hope, and the hope is in Christ alone, it's because of that hope that I literally cannot wait to wake up in the morning hmm. because I want to proclaim that hope Yes, it's dark. Yes, it's miserable. Yes, it's getting worse. But there's also hope. And I want whatever time I've got left in my life to stop hold Jesus as the only hope for the world. And I ask people to turn to him and he alone, because he is the one who said, when I am lifted up, I will draw men to myself. And so... The hope is Christ and Christ alone. And not the church, not denomination, not the Pope, not bishops, not pastors, not anybody else, only Christ. And that's where the hope is. And I challenge every pastor who is watching right now to lift up Christ, not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. And if we, the pastors, begin to take seriously the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to see the change happen. How do non-believers discern, they're hearing different voices that call themselves Christian. Cacophony. How do they discern who is yeah. Jesus really? Is it what this guy says he yeah. is or is it who this guy says he is? That's exactly right. That's a good, good question because the only Jesus that you need to know is the Jesus in the Bible. You go to the scripture and you read the gospel of John I mean, through the years, we have had the radical Jesus, the conservative Jesus, this Jesus and that Jesus. But these are, these are Jesus is made by people. It's not the Jesus, the Son of God, who eternally coexisted with the Father before all world, who laid down the splendor, not his divinity, but the splendor of his divinity. And he became God-man, fully man, fully God, in order to die on that cross a sinless holy, righteous God in order to redeem and save and forgive every sinner who repents and turn to him. See, that's the only Jesus that Paul said, any other gospel other than this gospel, let them be an anathema, let them be cursed. And so many people are who are twisting the word of God for their own purposes, they will be cursed one day, they will face a judgment one day, and it's going to be so severe I don't want to be anywhere near them. There might be people, though, who say, Michael, well, I've looked at some parts of the Bible, and it's, there's some offensive stuff in there. Well, that's the good news about the Bible. That's <laughs> the greatness of our Bible. 
They never took people and to the laundromat and washed them and cleansed them and then uh, starched them and then put a cellophane around them, put them on a platform and say, now be like them. No, the Bible shows us people with their warts and all, and they show us their failure and God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. See, that is why the Bible is the true word of God. 1,600 years, spanning 1,600 years, 40 plus writers all said the same thing. There's no book like it. And so if you ever in doubt, uh, I hope you get in touch with us and we have material we'd love to give you. It will help you understand the truth about the gospel. We don't want anything from you. We, we, we're not uh, uh, asking you to do anything for us. We're asking you because of your eternal life is so valuable. Jesus said, what profits a man or a woman if he gains the whole world and loses his or her soul? Nothing. What can give a man for the soul? The soul is so valuable that made the Son of God come from heaven, die on a cross so that he may redeem that soul. And so every soul that is searching, there is Jesus. He's welcoming you. He's inviting you. And I pray that you'll come to him. And it's not an exclusive invitation. It's not for one group of people or another. It's for everyone, Bible everyone said, with breath. Whomsoever. That's a beautiful word. Whomsoever. Whomsoever believes, it's for whomsoever. And it doesn't say only for this group or that group, and I've only done this for that. No, no, no. Whomsoever. Whomsoever could be you. Forgiveness and grace. Amen. Those are two things that we don't, I don't know that people who are not believers truly understand the, the largeness yeah. of forgiveness and grace that Christ offers. Absolutely, and because it's out of his mercy that he keeps us still alive now. Because of his mercy, he is giving people one more chance to hear the truth, turn to him. And when you turn to him, he will give you grace, more grace than you can handle. I have received more grace in my 54 years of walking with Christ that I am so overwhelmed with gratitude for the grace of God. But you can only experience that grace of God when you respond to his mercy mm. and come to him. And prayer. Yeah. Do Christians need to be praying for boldness in these days? Arm us up, Michael. Yeah. How do we need to clothe ourselves as we handle this present crisis? Well, it is, it is you know, prayer, of course, is intimacy with God, is, is like the air you breathe. You can't say, well, I breathed yesterday. Okay, I'm not going <laughs> to breathe today. Or I ate yesterday. I can eat today. No, no. It's a daily, moment-by-moment -moment intimacy with Christ. But only after a person repents can be able to experience that. But the problem is, here's with this pandemic, scared a lot of people. They're living in fear. I want to shake some of my neighbors who are terrified. I said, we're all going to die. You will die one day. Don't live in fear. And so I'm not afraid. I'm just uh, trying to be cautious. Well, that's okay. We all, you know, we, God gave us a certain amount of fear that will help us to be so, for self-preservation. But perverted fear is what makes you live terrified of everything in life. Uh, it's like heads you win, tails you win. Live you win, die you win. And Paul said that. He said, for me to die is gain. Uh, to live is Christ. So either way. We should not live in fear. I'm talking to the believers now. Throw away your fear. Fill yourself with the faith of Christ. I've heard you say before that for believers, this world is as bad as it will ever be. Exactly. For non-believers, this yeah. world is as good as this it will ever be. as good as it's going to be, yeah. How do we speak to one another? How do the believers who are suffering in this world encourage the non-believers who believe this world is all they've got? Well, I think the way we live, the way we behave, the way we uh, speak, and the way we conduct ourselves, I mean, people will see that. that you, you don't have to pull people out that are pill. you got to believe in Jesus. Well, uh, some people might need that, but generally <laughs> speaking, they're watching us. People are watching us, whether we know it or not. They're watching how we're going to... If they see us as terrified of a little bug, um, uh, called COVID-19, as they are, they say, well, why their faith has not done them any good. They are fearful as I am. 
And so it is how we live. It's how we allow our life to witness to our words, not just words, but the life that is lived is what really communicates more than anything else. Well, there is hope in this present crisis. Yes. In fact, that is the title of your newest book. And in that book, Michael, you say that ours is the generation that must make this choice. How? How can we decide to rescue our culture from what seems like seemingly inevitable collapse? Mm -hmm. We as individual believers can because one person can make the difference. I'm convinced of that. You look at the scriptures. It was never a committee. Um, and, and you know, we used to have all these large gatherings, big stadium and stuff. That's fine. But you look, one man, even though he was initially disobedient, uh, Jonah, mm. but finally when he obeyed and went to Nineveh, he saved the whole nation. Mm. And I can go down the, the scripture, uh, you know, one after another after another. It takes one person. You offer seven steps in this book. Seven's not an arbitrary number, I'm sure. Of course. Number one is remember the truth. Yeah. First thing we've got to do. That's right. As we talked about the post-truth culture, that's, that, that is really probably the primary uh, core of the problem, cultural problem that we have, is the absolute truth is now um, non-existent. Nobody believes it. Even some people in pulpits say, well, there's no uh, absolute truth. And so when that goes, everything else goes with it. And so we need to go back to the truth and believe the truth, practice the truth, live the truth. You also talk about families. Reestablish the classroom and also the family is a big yeah, part of this. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a series currently uh, on the 21st century, because this is the vision of our church for the decade of the 20s, is we say transferring the whole truth, uh, the whole truth, because we can transfer a little bit of truth, transferring the whole truth to the next generation. Mm. And we're doing this on all levels uh, of the church, from children to all the adults' ministries well, that we have. And, and uh, I, I am saying that basically three-legged stools, uh, three-legged stool, the family, the school, and the church. Now, if the school fails, at least you got, you can, you have two legs, <laughs> the family and the church. But if you have one of those two fail, then these people up the creek without a paddle. And so we, we, we need the church, the family, and the schools if possible to work together in order to bring a next generation to believe the truth. Because without that, I don't know. Uh, I remember one time uh, in the early days when God was speaking to me about forming the Church of the Apostles, birthing the church. And my kids were going to a, a traditionally, used to be a Christian school, but it almost anti-Christian. Wow. And then we were in a church and I was, I was having the opportunity to minister, but I was a volunteer. I wasn't on staff. And then there's a change in that church, and a group of pastors came and said, ah, our kids in Sunday school giving Jesus too much airtime. In the church, back in the 80s. Wow. And the Lord began to convict me. He said, you know, with this three-legged thing, as said, of course, you lost the school. Now you got the church working against you. You only have the home. Now, God's grace would have ruled, overruled, but I believe that this is God used that kind of argument to get me to go ahead, get off my blessed assurance and birth <laughs> the church of the apostles, even for, for nothing else, for my own children. So they have a godly environment with other godly kids to grow up together, and they have. Revive the church. Yeah. How do we do that? And I know you're calling on individuals for yeah. this. How do we as individuals revive the church? I think the pastors who have departed from the truth for the sake of compromising out of fear uh, of losing their job or losing members, they need to repent. Mm. That's the very first line of defense in the church. If the pastors repent and begin to proclaim the whole counsel of God and begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ uncompromised, unmolested, I think this is the beginning. 
Once you do that, a revival will take place in the church. But if the pastors are preaching falsehoods or a compromised, watered-down gospel, then I used to have a friend who went to be with the Lord. He used to say, as goes the pulpit, so goes the pew. Mm. And as goes the pew, so goes society. I encourage people to get this book, Hope in This Present Crisis. Amen. You do address the crisis, and you do offer hope. Amen. Amen. Thank Michael you. Youssef, thank you thank so you much. much. The name of the book, again, is Hope for This Present Crisis, and you can be an agent of change right where God put you, and not later, but right now. And this book will help you learn just how to lovingly and persuasively communicate God's message to a broken world. On behalf of Dr. Michael Youssef and the team of Leading the Way, thank you for joining us. As the eyes of the world focus on the latest flood of calamities, the most urgent may not be the most visible to the average person. Yet it is a growing menace that could ravage Western civilization. What is this crisis? The removal of foundational principles, the lessening influence of Christianity, the resistance to the guardrails of biblical morality are all producing growing decadence and cultural disintegration. For decades, we have seen an erosion of Christian values, but today we are experiencing a world gone mad. Christ followers are being edged out of cultural and political influence, attacks coming from seemingly all sides, from within the church and from the outside. Forces are at work to strip the principles and precepts of faith from public venues in an attempt to minimize their significance. Cultural norms are shifting. The erosion of civilization is accelerating. What can we do in a world hostile to Christianity? Dr. Yusuf presents a seven-part plan providing practical steps on how to be a godly influence in our society and how to take a stand for our faith in a culture aggressively opposed to the truth of Christ. You can read how to be a champion for truth and biblical principles. When you order your copy of Hope for This Present Crisis, you'll also receive a free digital download, the Hope for This Present Crisis Action Guide. This helpful guide features chapter-by-chapter -chapter reflection, question, and prompts for guided prayer. The world is changing, moving further and further away from biblical foundations. But there is hope for this present crisis if we act now. Contact us today to order your copy of Hope for This Present Crisis for your gift of any amount. Get a copy of this timely book in your hands. Passionately proclaiming uncompromising truth, leading the way with Dr. Michael Youssef thanks you for your faithful support through your continued prayers and gifts.